A Smile of Fortune by Joseph Conrad Prologue Harbor Story Ever since the sun rose, I had been looking ahead. The ship glided gently in smooth water. After a sixty days' passage, I was anxious to make landfall, a fertile and beautiful island of the tropics. The more enthusiastic of its inhabitants delight in describing it as the Pearl of the Ocean. Well, let us call it the Pearl. It's a good name. A pearl distilling much sweetness upon the world. This is only a way of telling you that first-rate sugar cane is grown there. All the population of the Pearl lives for it and by it. Sugar is their daily bread, as it were, and I was coming to them for a cargo of sugar in the hope of the crop having been good and of the freights being high. Mr. Burns, my chief mate, made out the land first, and very soon I became entranced by this blue, pinnacled apparition, almost transparent against the light of the sky, a mere emanation, the astral body of an island risen to greet me from afar, it is a rare phenomenon, such a sight of the pearl at sixty miles off, and I wondered half seriously whether it was a good omen, whether what would meet me in that island would be as luckily exceptional as this beautiful dreamlike vision so very few seamen have been privileged to behold. But horrid thoughts of business interfered with my enjoyment of an accomplished passage. I was anxious for success, and I wished, too, to do justice to the flattering latitude of my owner's instructions contained in the one noble phrase, We leave it to you to do the best you can with the ship. All the world being thus given me for a stage, my abilities appeared to me no bigger than a pinhead. Meantime the wind dropped and Mr. Burns began to make disagreeable remarks about my usual bad luck. I believe it was his devotion for me which made him critically outspoken on every occasion. All the same, I would not have put up with his humors if it had not been my lot at one time to nurse him through a desperate illness at sea. After snatching him out of the jaws of death, so to speak, it would have been absurd to throw away such an efficient officer, but sometimes I wished he would dismiss himself. We were late in closing in with the land and had to anchor outside the harbor till next day. An unpleasant and unrestful night followed. In this roadstead, strange to both of us, Burns and I remained on deck almost all the time, clouds swirled down the porphyry crags under which we lay. The rising wind made a great bullying noise amongst the naked spars with interludes of sad moaning. I remarked that we had been in luck to fetch the anchorage before dark. It would have been a nasty anxious night to hang off a harbor under canvas. But my chief mate was uncompromising in his attitude. Luck, you call it, sir, eh, our usual luck, the sort of luck to thank God it's no worse. And so he fretted through the dark hours while I drew on my fund of philosophy. Ah, but it was an exasperating, weary, endless night to be lying at anchor close under that black coast. The agitated water made sweet gnarling sounds all round the ship. At times a wild gust of wind out of a gully high up on the cliff struck on our rigging a harsh and plaintive note like the wail of a forsaken soul. A Smile of Fortune Chapter 1 Read by Donald Miller By half past seven in the morning the ship being then inside the harbor at last and moored within a long stone's throw from the quay, my stock of philosophy was nearly exhausted. I was dressing hurriedly in my cabin 
when the steward came tripping in with a morning suit over his arm. Hungry, tired, and depressed, with my head engaged inside a white shirt, irritatingly stuck together by too much starch, I desired him peevishly to heave round with that breakfast. I wanted to get ashore as soon as possible. Yes, sir. Ready at eight, sir. There's a gentleman from the shore waiting to speak to you, sir. This statement was curiously slurred. I dragged the shirt violently over my head and emerged staring. So early, I cried, Who's he? What does he want? On coming in from sea, one has to pick up the conditions of an utterly unrelated existence. Every little event, at first, has the peculiar emphasis of novelty. I was greatly surprised by that early caller. But there was no reason for my steward to look so particularly foolish. Didn't you ask for the name? I inquired in a stern tone. His name's Jacobus, I believe, he mumbled shamefacedly. Mr. Jacobus, I exclaimed loudly, more surprised than ever, but with a total change in feeling. Why couldn't you say so at once? But the fellow had scuttled out of the room. Through the momentarily open door, I had a glimpse of a tall, stout man standing in the cuddy by the table on which the cloth was already laid, a harbor tablecloth stainless and dazzlingly white, so far good. I shouted courteously through the closed door that I was dressing and would be with him in a moment. In return, the assurance that there was no hurry reached me in the visitor's deep, quiet undertone. His time was his own. He dared say I would give him a cup of coffee presently. I am afraid you will have a poor breakfast, I cried apologetically. We have been sixty-one days at sea, you know. A quiet little laugh with a, that'll be all right, Captain, was his answer. All this, words intonation and glimpsed attitude of the man in the cuddy had an unexpected character, a something friendly in it, propitiatory, and my surprise was not diminished thereby. What did this call mean? Was it the sign of some dark design against my commercial innocence? All these commercial interests spoiling the finest life under the sun, why must the sea be used for trade, and for war as well? Why kill and traffic on it, pursuing selfish aims of no great importance after all? It would have been so much nicer just to sail about with here and there a port and a bit of land to stretch one's legs on, buy a few books and get a change of cooking for a while. But living in a world more or less homicidal and desperately mercantile, it was plainly my duty to make the best of its opportunities. My owner's letters had left it to me, as I have said before, to do my best for the ship, according to my own judgment. But it contained also a postscript, worded somewhat as follows. Without meaning to interfere with your liberty of action, we are writing by the outgoing mail to some of our business friends there who may be of assistance to you. We desire you particularly to call on Mr. Jacobus, a prominent merchant and charterer. Should you hit it off with him, he may be able to put you in the way of profitable employment for the ship. Hit it off. Here was the prominent creature, absolutely on board, asking for the favor of a cup of coffee, and life not being a fairy tale, the improbability of the event almost shocked me. Had I discovered an enchanted nook of the earth where wealthy merchants rush fasting on board ships before they are fairly moored? Was this white magic or merely some black trick of trade? I came in the end, while making the bow of my tie, to suspect that perhaps I did not get the name right. I had been thinking of the prominent Mr. Jacobus pretty frequently during the passage, and my hearing might have been deceived by some remote similarity of sound. 
the steward might have said Antrobus or maybe Jackson. But coming out of my stateroom with an interrogative, Mr. Jacobus, I was met by a quiet yes, uttered with a gentle smile. The yes was rather perfunctory. He didn't seem to make much of the fact that he was Mr. Jacobus. I took stock of a big, pale face, hair thin on the top, whiskers also thin of a faded, nondescript color, heavy eyelids. The thick, smooth lips in repose looked as if glued together. The smile was faint, a heavy, tranquil man. I named my two officers who just then came down to breakfast. But why Mr. Burns's silent demeanor which should suggest suppressed indignation I could not understand. While we were taking our seats round the table, some disconnected words of an altercation going on in the companionway reached my ear. A stranger apparently wanted to come down to interview me and the steward was opposing him. You can't see him. Why can't I? The captain is at breakfast, I tell you. He'll be going on shore presently, and you can speak to him on deck. That's not fair. You let. I've had nothing to do with that. Oh, yes, you have. Everybody ought to have the same chance. You let that fellow. The rest I lost. The person having been repulsed successfully, the steward came down. I can't say he looked flushed. He was a mulatto. But he looked flustered. After putting the dishes on the table, he remained by the sideboard with that lackadaisical air of indifference he used to assume when he had done something too clever by half and was afraid of getting into a scrape over it. The contemptuous expression of Mr. Burns's face as he looked from him to me was really extraordinary. I couldn't imagine what new bee had stung the mate now. The captain being silent, nobody else cared to speak, as is the way in ships, and I was saying nothing simply because I had been made dumb by the splendor of the entertainment. I had expected the usual sea breakfast, whereas I beheld spread before us a veritable feast of shore provisions, eggs, sausages, butter, which plainly did not come from a Danish tin, cutlets, and even a dish of potatoes. It was three weeks since I had seen a real live potato. I contemplated them with interest, and Mr. Jacobus disclosed himself as a man of human, homely sympathies, and something of a thought reader. Try them, Captain, he encouraged me in a friendly undertone. They are excellent. They look that, I admitted, Grown on the island, I suppose? Oh, no, imported. Those grown here would be more expensive. I was grieved at the ineptitude of the conversation. Were these the topics for a prominent and wealthy merchant to discuss? I thought the simplicity with which he made himself at home rather attractive, but what is one to talk about to a man who comes on one suddenly? after sixty-one days at sea, out of a totally unknown little town in an island who has never seen before. What were, besides sugar, the interests of that crumb of the earth, its gossip, its topics of conversation, to draw him on business at once would have been almost indecent, or even worse, impolitic. All I could do at the moment was to keep on the old groove. Are the provisions generally dear here? I asked, fretting inwardly at my inanity. I wouldn't say that, he answered placidly, with the appearance of saving his breath. His, his restrained manner of speaking suggested he would not be more explicit, yet he did not evade the subject, eyeing the table in a spirit of complete obstemuniousness, he wouldn't let me help him to any edibles. He went into details of supply, 
the beef was for the most part imported from Madagascar. Mutton, of course, was rare and somewhat expensive, but good goat's flesh. Are these goat's cutlets? I exclaimed hastily, pointing at, at one of the dishes. Posed sentimentally by the sideboard, the steward gave a start. Lord, no, sir, it's real mutton. Mr. Burns got through his breakfast impatiently, as if exasperated by being made a party to some monstrous foolishness. He muttered a curt excuse and went on deck. Shortly afterwards, the second mate took his smooth red countenance out of the cabin. With the appetite of a schoolboy, and after two months of seafare, he appreciated the generous spread, but I did not. It smacked me of extravagance. All the same, it was a remarkable feat to have produced it so quickly, and I congratulated the steward on his smartness in a somewhat ominous tone. He gave me a deprecatory smile, and, in a way, I didn't know what to make of blinked his fine dark eyes in the direction of the guest. The latter asked, under his breath, for another cup of coffee, and nibbled ascetically at a piece of very hard ship's biscuit. I don't think he consumed a square inch in the end, but meantime he gave me, casually as it were, a complete account of the sugar crop, of the local business houses, of the state of the freight market, all that talk was interspersed with hints as to personalities amounting to veiled warnings, but his pale, fleshy face remained equable without a gleam, as if ignorant of his voice. As you may imagine, I opened my ears very wide. Every word was precious. My ideas as to the value of business friendship were being favorably modified. He gave me the names of all the disponsible ships together with their tonnage and the names of their commanders. From that, which was still commercial information, he condescended to mere harbor gossip. The Hilda had unaccountably lost her figurehead in the Bay of Bengal, and her captain was greatly affected by this. He and the ship had been getting on in years together with the old gentleman, imagined this strange event to be the forerunner of his own early dissolution. The Stella had experienced awful weather off the Cape, had her deck swept and the chief officer washed overboard, and only a few hours before reaching port the baby died. Poor Captain H. and his wife were terribly cut up, if they had only been able to bring it into port alive, it could have been probably saved, but the wind failed them for the last week or so. Light breezes, and the baby was going to be buried this afternoon. He supposed I would attend. Do you think I ought to? I asked shrinkingly. He thought so, decidedly. It would be greatly appreciated. All the captains in the harbor were going to attend, Poor Mrs. H. was quite prostrated, pretty hard on H. altogether. And you, Captain, you are not married, I suppose? No, I am not married, I said, neither married nor even engaged. Mentally, I thanked my stars, and while he smiled in amusing, dreamy fashion, I expressed my acknowledgments for his visit and for the interesting business information he had been good enough to impart to me but I said nothing of my wonder thereat. Of course I would have made a point of calling on you in a day or two, I concluded. He raised his eyelids distinctly at me and somehow managed to look rather more sleepy than before. In accordance with my owner's instructions, I explained, you have had their letter, of course. By that time he had raised his eyebrows, too, but without any particular emotion. On the contrary, he struck me, then, as absolutely imperturbable. Oh, you must be thinking of my brother. It was for me, then, to say, oh, but I hope that no more than civil surprise appeared in my voice when I asked him, too, what, then, I owed the pleasure. He was reaching 
for an inside pocket leisurely. My brother is a very different person, but I am well known in this part of the world, you've probably heard. I took a card he extended to me, a thick business card as I lived. Alfred Jacobus, the other was Ernest, dealer in every description of ship stores, provisions, salt and fresh, oils, paints, ropes, canvas, etc., etc., and ships and harbor victualled by contract on moderate terms. I've never heard of you, I said brusquely. His low-pitched assurance did not abandon him. You'll be very well satisfied, he breathed out quietly. I was not placated. I had the sense of having been circumvented somehow. Yet I had deceived myself, if there was any deception. But the confounded cheek of inviting himself to breakfast was enough to deceive anyone. And the thought struck me, why? The fellow had provided all these edibles himself in the way of business. I said, You must have got up mighty early this morning. He admitted with simplicity that he was on the quay before six o'clock, waiting for my ship to come in. He gave me the impression that it would be impossible to get rid of him now. If you think we are going to live on that scale, I said, looking at the table with an irritated eye, you are jolly well mistaken. You'll find it all right, Captain. I quite understand. Nothing could disturb his equanimity. I felt dissatisfied, but I could not very well fly out at him. He had told me many useful things, and besides, he was the brother of that wealthy merchant. That seemed queer enough. I rose and told him curtly that I must now go ashore. At once, he offered the use of his boat for all the time of my stay in port. I only make a nominal charge, he continued equably. My man remains all day at the landing steps. You have only to blow a whistle when you want the boat. And standing aside at every doorway to let me go through first, he carried me off in his custody after all. We crossed the quarter deck, two shabby individuals stepped forward, and in mournful silence offered me business cards, which I took from them without a word under his heavy eye. It was a useless and gloomy ceremony. They were the touts of the other ship chandlers, and he, placid at my back, ignored their existence. We parted on the quay after he had expressed quietly the hope of seeing me often at the store. He had a smoking room for captains there, with newspapers and a box of rather decent cigars. I left him very unceremoniously. My consignees received me with the usual business heartiness, but their account of the state of the freight market was by no means so favorable as the talk of the wrong Jacobus had led me to expect. Naturally, I became inclined now to put my trust in his version rather. As I closed the door of the private office behind me, I thought to myself, hmm, a lot of lies, commercial diplomacy. That's the sort of thing a man coming from sea has got to expect. They would try to charter the ship under the market rate. In the big, outer room, full of desks, the chief clerk, a tall, lean, shaved person in immaculate white clothes, and with a shiny, closely cropped black head on which silvery gleams came and went, rose from his place and detained me affably. Anything they could do for me, they would be most happy. Was I likely to call again in the afternoon? What? Going to a funeral? Oh, yes, poor Captain H. He pulled a long, sympathetic face for a moment, then, dismissing from his workaday world the baby, which had got ill in a tempest and had died from too much calm at sea, he asked me with a dental, shark-like smile, if sharks had false teeth, whether I had yet my little arrangements for the ship's stay in port. Yes, with Jacobus, I answered carelessly. 
I understand he's the brother of Mr. Ernest Jacobus, to whom I have an introduction from my owners. I was not sorry to let him know I was not altogether helpless in the hands of his firm. He screwed his thin lips dubiously. Why, I cried, isn't he the brother? Oh, yes. They haven't spoken to each other for eighteen years, he added impressively after a pause. Indeed, what's the quarrel about? Oh, nothing. Nothing that one would care to mention, he protested primly. He's got quite a large business, the best ship chandler here, without doubt. Uh, business is very well, but there is such a thing as personal character, too, isn't there? Good morning, Captain. He went away mincingly to his desk. He amused me. He resembled an old maid, a commercial old maid, shocked by some impropriety. Was it a commercial impropriety? Commercial impropriety is a serious matter, for it aims at one's pocket. Or was he only a purist in conduct who disapproved of Jacobus doing his own touting? It was certainly undignified. I wonder how the merchant brother liked it. But then, different countries, different customs. In a community so isolated and so exclusively trading, social standards have their own scale.' 